Hey guys, hopefully you can hear me okay. Perfect, thanks. Can you see my screen all right as well? Hey, Malia, I'm just after adding you there to the speaking um, uh, preferences as well. So if you want to do an intro at the start or anything like that, feel free to. Um, or if you want to jump in at any point with with uh, with questions for the group or anything along those lines, um, please feel free to. Sure, sure, sure. Super, super. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for doing this. Oh, don't be silly. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> Uh, how are the how are the attendees looking like from from the cohort? I see there's a good few people joining now. I think we have like twenty seven. Perfect. Yeah, I think we have like twenty seven or like twenty seven start. Oh, wonderful! Great, that's great numbers. Like I'm sure some of them will not attend now, and they know that there will be a registration provided. So yeah. Uh, some will certainly uh, look at the registration, but we are expecting, I don't know, at least some 15, 20 cool. start to join. Yeah, you usually have a usually have a drop off rate about somewhere anywhere between sort of 40, 50 percent, depending on the yeah. good ones is to be about 50 percent. So that, that's perfect. Right. Cool. Welcome everyone. I can see there's a good you after joining as well. Um, so we'll get we'll get started in. I'll give I'll give people three or four minutes um just to come in and then we can we can start then from there. Um, for any of you that um uh, if any of you have any uh, questions at all um during the sessions, do feel free just to pop them into the chat. Uh, I do like to answer questions on the fly. Um, I don't particularly like 
me talking at you the whole time as if it's a lecture and there's nothing worse. So if you do have any questions, chat them in. Um, the other thing that I was kind of going to go and say to everyone as well is that um, don't hold them back until the end. I do have it as part of the agenda that we will have time for questions at the end, but it's always nice to get them the whole way through. Uh, if I'm speaking fast or my Irish accent gets a little bit too much at times, also stop me. Uh, I appreciate that. I do have quite a strong Irish accent. And when I get excited, I talk a little bit too fast. Um, so if anyone does have any issues, do please feel, to, feel, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so as I said, look, I'll, I'll give you a couple more minutes just as we're letting people trickle in. Um, and we'll start at about three minutes past, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, also, before anyone asks, this is a background. It's not, I'm not in a HubSpot office right now. Uh, so. <laughs> Okay, so by my watch, it's just gone three minutes past now. So let let's um let's let's kick on and, and let people join as we come through, right? So today's session, and thank you so much, Startup Moldova, for having me. Um, today's session is all about scaling your startup sales process, right? And and really, how can you guys build a very uh, robust sales program going forward right and it's always the same questions i get um about sales it's always either a little bit of the fear of letting go of sales or not having the right process or generally just being a little bit worried about rejection um like like we all are um during that process right so before I kick on and maybe go through exactly what we're going to cover today uh <clears throat> if any of you have your phone out uh, please feel free to scan the, the QR code there. That is essentially just your link to, to your free HubSpot account if you wanted to sign up for it at any stage. So feel free to, to do that. Uh, I don't look like a QR code, just as it's usually my face that's there. But um, just a little bit about me. So my name's Owen. Um, so call me Owen or Ian, whatever you guys feel more comfortable with. Um, I'm the head of startups for Central and Eastern Europe. I also look after the Middle East and Africa, right? So my, my job is essentially to educate startups. I'm also a founder, uh, an entrepreneur, and I'm an angel investor on the side. Um, I had my first exit in 2012 at the age of 22. I was also the head, <coughs> excuse me, of a startup in Australia for a number for for about 16 months. Um, we had a sales team of, of nine and we I was able to help that team grow from 1.2 million to 4.8 million in 16 months. We also went through a seed funding round at the time. So um, I've been on your side, um, which is great. And that that's why uh, the guys have asked me to join today. Um, I'm not here to talk about HubSpot at all. What I'm here to talk about is, is sales and what, what I know uh, at this point. So let, let's kick on. Let's get straight into it. All right. So first thing that we're going to touch on is from today's agenda, we're going to talk about the change in the buying experience. We're going to move through value propos prop propositions and how to create them successfully. 
Then we're going to look at the creating of the sales process itself, right? So what does that look like? How can we build it? And how do we make it quite robust? And how do we improve upon what you might already have, but maybe you need to tweak and change a few things, or maybe you don't have anything at all. We'll, we'll kind of give you the blueprint to start from there. Um, implementing the frictionless sales framework, right? And that sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is. It's how do you build your sales process to actually map your buyer and the type of buyer you have and what they're genuinely interested in, right? The, the, Point six then is leveraging video in sales. Um, and I'll, I'll it kind of, it, it, it's a very simplified process, but what it does is it gives a huge amount of personalization and value to your journey. And then the very last bit is how do we accelerate that with automation, right? So how can I take the things that we're going to run through today and how can I automate them? So instead of having to consistently get more headcount in terms of sales, you know, bums on seats, essentially, how can we, build an automation framework that will that'll make it a little bit easier. And as I said, we've got Q&A at the end. Now, to anyone, everyone that's just joined, uh, Q&A, please chat through the whole time. Um, if you've got questions, you want a little bit of extra tips on something, or maybe I haven't explained something very well, just come through to the chat. Uh, I have it open on my screen here. You'll see my eyes drifting on the other side. I've got another screen over here on my right-hand side. So I will be monitoring the chat as we go through as well. So let's, let's start off, right? Where is the role of inbound in the buyer's journey? And what I mean by inbound is essentially the buyers now, regardless of what industry you're in, essentially have all the control, right? Most buyers will be very informed before they ever engage in a sales process, regardless, and again, I go back to this, regardless of what industry you're in, right? Buyers have got better at being, at blocking interruptions in a sales process. So what I really mean by that is cold calling, right? And like, if I take all of you that are on the, the, the session today, um, do any of you answer cold calls anymore? I certainly don't. The only people that I answer the phone there are my friends and, and my parents, uh, and that's about it. So what we want to do is we want to, how can we move from that intrusive process to something that is more focused on the buyer, right? And that's what we want to make sure. Now, again, the last thing there is, you know, the buyer's heightened expectations around the experience. So what do they want? And then how do we morph that into exactly what we want to do? So I'd like to introduce you to Timmy. Timmy is a typical average B2B buyer, right, for me. So we can see that he's roughly between the age of 34 uh, 35 and 44. He's got a master's degree. He uses Facebook and Instagram. He reports to the CTO. He uses email and social media. You know, their job is measured by employee satisfaction. We can see again a certain bunch of things that's in relation to Timmy, right? And then when we look at what Timmy's purchases process used to look like. This was a typical process. He went to a conference. We met someone at a conference. We got his business card. We called him. We had a call meeting. We had an on-site day purchased. Happy customer, right? Typical. That's the way people used to buy, particularly in the 90s and the early, early 2000s. Any look at the standard kind of linear buying process, we can see that the awareness stage is very much face to face. Consideration is very much face to face. And then the decision making process is also, again, maybe a little bit less face to face, but it's very much sort of heavily focused on the sales team. It's less on marketing and more on sales. When we look at the journey now in 2022, Timmy scrolls on LinkedIn. He finds an interesting post. He clicks on a blog. He clicks and does a call to action on that blog. The next day, he goes in, he talks to his team, he follows up with a Google search. They download an ebook and so on and so forth. Now that journey that Timmy has gone on is completely dramatically changed. 
right? He focuses on so many different things. And you'll notice here, like we've got, you know, a sales call is, is essentially in the middle of that process. And you can see that he's come to a webinar and the sales call is another one down here a little bit further. What, what has happened is today's process is not about what you sell. It's about how you sell it and how you go to market. And that's so important. And again, going back to my, my earlier point, and I'll keep rehashing this, this doesn't matter what industry you're in. This happens in every industry, right? So we need to think about that selling motion. And when I look at a, a buying process, does it match the buyer themselves, right? And I'll give you an example of this that happened to me today, okay? Vodafone, I'm, I'm living in Ireland. Vodafone, who is a telecommunications company, knocked at my door while I'm in the middle of a meeting and tried to sell me broadband. Now, in chat, if anyone wants to comment on it, what do you think my experience was with that company now? It was terrible. I will never buy. I will never buy from them because they've completely completely given me such an and thank you so much for mentioning there it was it was negative it was really it really was a negative experience because it's not the way I like to buy I like to do my research and then I will come to the companies I want to talk to right and that's just one experience that's a personal experience for me today so when we look at that traditional sales process it was a funnel right we've got marketing we've got sales and then we've got a smaller proportion of those become customers when we look at the whole journey now, it needs to be, it needs to change, right? Because essentially this is the idea of what we call a flywheel. And that idea of regardless of where someone is in the journey, right? We need to be able to propel them and move them forward like a wheel, right? Because we need to have that full picture of everything that they're doing from start to finish. And that's really important to the overall journey, right? And that's what goes on to, you know, what is your value proposition, right? So when we look at the value proposition, before you begin selling, we need to nail down what makes us different. It's not that we've got a world-class product or we've got the best-in-class product or, and again, I know I'm doing, ex, ex, uh, uh, I'm doing kind of negative condemnation here, but what I'm trying to get at is, it's what is the pain point our customers are facing and then how do we solve them in a bite-sized piece of information, right? And I've taken a couple of good examples that I really like, right? Slacks. Imagine what you've accomplished together, right? I very quickly can, can really, really understand what they're trying to achieve here. They're trying to say to us, we can better communicate together, right? That's what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at that helps us grow faster. If you look at this one as an example, built, engage, retarget your audience, with web push notifications. Again, I know exactly what they're doing. And I know the pain points that I'm feeling when I read this little block as well down here on the bottom, right? What I'm getting at is we're trying to give sharp, snappy information that tells a story about us as a company, but also in terms of our value proposition. What are we trying to do, all right? I'll share these slides, which is after, so you can have a look at them as well. So again, just a, just a quick caveat on that. When we look then at creating that sales process, we essentially have to be in our buyer's shoes, right? So what way would I like to be sold to, right? Um, and anyone that knows me personally will know I love being sold to. I love being sold to in a really good and easy way because I can appreciate that they understand the way I like to buy, right? And when we look at creating that sales process, we need to think about two parts of that, right? One, we've got the sales process, which is essentially the steps to get a new customer from our sales team. The second part of that is the, the methodology. And what I mean by the methodology is, as the company grows, what do we essentially believe in? Right? So we need to have a fundamental truth in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And then the process is what gets us there. 
right? And that's the way I would think about the two of these. And they're both as important as each other, but without both of them, we have little breaks in that chain. And that's what we're trying not to, 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 um, you know, to have essentially. So let, let's have a look at some of the steps or the, uh, as I described kind of the six steps to a sales process, right? First one is prospecting. So where are we finding leads? Who are they? Where are they coming from? What are the stages that need to go into that? So do we have a business development rep? Do we buy lists? Do we have an inbound strategy? What are we doing to find those leads and where are they coming from? Second one is connecting and qualifying. So that, it's that very first stage of the buying process, that discovery call. Um, what, what is happening? What is, you know, is this a good fit for our business? Is it not a good fit for our business? And so on and so forth. Third stage is really then around research and discovery again, right? So Again, you'll notice I keep using the word discovery. Every stage is discovery, right? We really want to understand key challenges, type of industry. What is their business model? What are their goals? What are they looking to achieve, right? And this is a little bit more centric towards a B2B or a B2C. For a B2C business, this might be a little bit more condensed. But from a B2B side of things, this is this is usually a little, a lot bigger, right? So... Then what we will look at then stage four is the, you know, is, is presenting. How can I present my product or service that fits into the pain that our customer is feeling? Because they've just told us in step three, right? But how can I present that pain point to them in an articulate way, right? What is going to make sense for them? We look at five, which is a, a handling objections. Nothing is ever smooth in this world. So we need to be able to have a very clear understanding of what our prospects are looking for or potential customers are looking for. And, you know, what are the common things that they're going to ask us and, and how can we have something, you know, essentially pre-planned or we know what the answer would be, even if it's slightly on the fly. And then the last stage, which is what everyone concentrates too much on, right, is closing. All right. Closing is really important and absolutely is. But if we don't have that discovery and understanding of what a customer actually wants, closing is a lot harder because you never get there. Right. And we need to appreciate that there's going to be a drop off rate from each one of these stages. We just need to be very clear on those. Right. So one of the challenges I'm going to put to you all after this is if you want to actually make use of this presentation today and this conversation today, I want you to go back after, maybe not tonight, maybe tomorrow at some stage, and look at the selling activities is to your buying activities, your, your buyer's activities, and almost get in your, your shoes of your customer. Because... Again, depending on what industry you're at, are, right, these are always going to be the same. These aren't ever going to change, right? If it's a B2C customer, it's going to be a little bit more condensed. If it's a B2B customer, it's a little bit bigger, but we're still going to have these exact same stages to go into it, right? And I want you to go and I want you to write down the buyer activities that are related to that. So what are the buyers doing at these stages? What do they want to see? What are they interested in? And so on and so forth. And actually map that to your seller's journey. Because you will never be able to sell a large proportion of products for a long term in a scalable way unless you actually have this written down. All right. And that's really, really, really important. If you get nothing else from this session today, that is what I want you to get from is get into your buyer's shoes and map your sales process to what your buyers want, because um, it's going to be the most important thing. Right. Now, when we're looking at building trust through the buyer's journey, right, there's always different stages to it. Right. So you've, we break it down into three different stages, attract, convert and close right at the attract stage it's you know what are they looking at what are they interested in what are they focusing on how can i be personalized to that outreach and i can do it at scale not like the guy who knocked at my door today from vodafone right we want to give the personalized experience to that in the way that the buyer wants it to be right 
The next stage is converting. So making things very clear and giving people an opportunity to convert at any time. So I always use this example of the magic three on a website, which is there should always be a button that someone can purchase automatically. There should always be an information button. So here is 10 tips about X, Y, and Z. And then there should always be a third one, which is the chatbot down the bottom. And don't have the chatbot live, like let it be a, a, a form, right? So that's, that's a couple of quick examples on a website perspective. But what we want to be able to do is, and like what it says down here on the bottom, share stories, give research, give case studies, give something back to them. So it's constantly this, you're giving more than you're receiving, because at the end of the day, what you want them to do is you want to get them to that close stage as early and quickly as you can and then keep them as a customer for as long as you can. So if we over emphasize the amount of, you know, I suppose time and effort we put into them at the beginning, the long tail or the long term of that becomes um, a massively, massively increased number looking at these different close stages. Now, from there, for me and, and if I be completely frank, the secret sauce for any sales team is, is this very simple process called uh, GPCT, right? which is goals, plans, challenges, and timelines. It's a way that you can qualify, for, qualify your customers really quickly. right? And it's a way of being able to essentially figure out whether a customer is real. Right, or not. Um, so using goals, like what are they looking for? What are they trying to solve? How important is it? Is it going to is it going to make their lives, you know, a live in hell, or is it is it is it something that you don't really care about? And it's a nice to have, not a not a want to have, right? And we need to figure that out. Plans, like you know, when are they looking to do it? Um, you know, if they're a government body, uh, they might want to do it for six years, or if it's a small startup that's looking to scale fast, they might want to do it tomorrow. So we need to be able to qualify that in. Again, things like challenges, hurdles, these, these different areas, and then again, timelines. So, you know, how challenging it is it? When do they want to do it? And we want to make sure that they're kind of linked to each other. So you'll see the challenges are pretty similar to the timelines, right? And, and if we get that information from there, what we're essentially doing is we're building this consultative sales process, right? Again, this works in every industry because if we can build up that trust, we know that we're, we're essentially trying to understand what they're trying to do again, the likelihood of success um, becomes, becomes an awful lot higher. And if you look at the very first thing that's up here, top performing sales reps are 10 times likelier to use collaborative verbs. Um, and that's really important because we do want to build this, this idea of if I'm a consultant and I'm helping you, then you know that's where we want to get to at the end of the day. Are we actually making ourselves um, really, really, uh, you know, are we, are we making ourselves really, really um, helpful in, in the process? Uh, Nalia, thank you so much. Yeah, so you mentioned that you, I'm sorry, I'm just, I've got to just quickly answer a question that's come through. Um, so you mentioned that you own a startup and a successful exit at 22. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience and how did you make, uh, make it and what were your ingredients for, for success? Absolutely. Um, let me <laughs> go back a slide. GPCT. I know it sounds silly, but having that buyer's journey mapped in the correct way and asking good questions makes makes things a lot easier um and very upfront transparency in the process right so i set up my first company when i was 17 um i employed nine nine people and i grew the business from there and i had a huge number of corporate clients and the reason why i had a, a lot of corporate clients and they were dealing with like a fresh faced spots on his face 19 year old kid was that essentially i didn't and excuse my language here but there was no bullshit. It was very straightforward. It was always very, very clear. So when we looked at, you know, trying to help them and help their, their knowledge sharing, that's one of the things that you find that will help, 
right? I turned down multiple clients through the years because they weren't a fit. If they're not a fit to what we're selling or to our core product type um, or our service type, then don't be afraid to let them go. And don't be afraid of rejection, right? I, got, I get rejected 99 times out of 100, but that one time is special because that's the one good customer that you're going to have and you're going to build a long-term lasting relationship. So from my experience, it's all about cutting out the bullshit, keeping everything really straightforward and transparent and making sure that you're not afraid to say no because your time and your company's time is so invaluable for success in the long term and if you don't do that it it's really really hard to to have a success because if you just say yes all the time your likelihood in long-term success decreases and that's why i always emphasize gpct and actually mapping everything to the buyer's journey is so important because if they don't map to even the seller journey if the buyer's journey and the seller journey don't overlap then they're not a good fit for you. Even if they're worth $10 million or 10 million euros here, they're not worth your time. Um, and that is one of those harsh truths that I don't like, I don't like mentioning very often, but it is, it is extremely true. Um, the other big thing that I would say there is when we look at building the elements of a good sales process, we do need to have um, we do need to have a little bit more of a consistent flow, right? And I'll get onto that in a second. So making sure the deal stages are, are factual, that they're set up appropriately, matching the way the buyer likes to purchase, which we've spent a lot of time on, and educate, don't sell. So don't sell, um, don't ever sell, educate, be a consultant, and help people with their business problems and pains, right? So looking at the current sales sales process, right? So maybe maybe with in the chat, um, maybe if you guys are actively selling right now, maybe just even put in a, a why or, an, or a why directly in there. Um, and if you are already selling, that would be cool. Just to see a show of hands, how many of you are actively built your sales process. Um, and if you haven't, just pop a little N or a little no. Um, that'll kind of help me gauge where everyone is at so I can be a little bit more tailored um, to that as well. Cool, I can see a hand up, which is good. Thank you, Anna. Cool. Yeah, B2B sales, that's perfect. Great. Okay, cool. So look, we'll we'll take you from there, right? So there is a lot of views that are already building a sales process, which is great. Okay. Now let's look at like how we can implement that a little bit more to be a little bit more successful, right? So again, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on these slides. We'll we'll kind of move through them fairly quickly. But what we want to do is like looking at improving your your buyer's journey, right? So again, this is map two is probably what we spend a good bit of time on already. The other areas that I think will be helpful is an analyzing your current process. So Look at your top 10 deals that you closed, right? It doesn't have to be last month. It could be ever if you wanted to, or you want to look at the top customers that you're having, right? And typically 80% of your, your revenue will come from 10% or 20% of your business, right? So depending on the business model. So again, looking at the top customers, are they actually mapping to the type of customer that you want to have? And what is the process that they like to buy from, right? So that's always a good place to start. Also, ring your customers, ask them. It's the easiest way to find out exactly what they're, what they're looking for and how to do that, right? So again, the other key thing that I always say to people is defining the exit criteria. Right. So when you look at the exit criteria, what are the things that are really important when you're moving something from one stage to another and then measure the results? Right. Again, very simple. Just make sure that you you are actually following up on that. Now, implementing this is actually fairly straightforward. Right. But it's it goes back into three different stages, enable, align and transform. Right. So, again, enable your team to spend more time selling. So less time actually talking, more time selling. Again, align with your team and your target buyer and then transform your team through a culture. So we'll take enable first. 
We look at traditionally, right? Blind, knocking on the door, calling, cold calling, like the old school leaflet drops, the old school approach to sales and marketing, right? That unfortunately no longer work, right? So we want to look at the, the main things that we used to happen. We used to focus on getting loads of leads, right? Now what we focus on is quality of leads and we, get in, we focus on an informed outreach process. And we want to be able to have a multitude of pieces of information coming into one place. And it doesn't matter what team you're a part of, everyone is in sales in some shape or form right so your ceo you know your your customer service person if you're working if it's a shop the person that's standing behind the desk we need to have everyone as as working on the same way right when we look at that how can we enable reps or how can we look at building that one is the sales process itself we need to make sure that there is a certain easy to follow day in the life of a salesperson and it's easy to find places, right, to automate. So finding areas that doesn't need human work that we can actually build a certain level of automation for will make life easier. Key metrics to enable this, again, time management, how long does it take, quota attainment, so how, how well are people doing. The second stage is alignment. Right. So again, what we want to look at is, you know, again, the frictionless process means, you know, traditionally everyone worked nine to five. Now it's an on demand, giving people the option to buy online or giving people the option to schedule their own calendar or that sort of information what we want to do. And again, we want to have a sort of a buyer driven process. So again, less of a sales process itself, but more of what does a buyer want and how easy can we make that happen? Happen, right and again that's a really big part of alignment now the important thing here is to take ownership of the customer experience and make it a priority because if you give someone a bad experience they're going to tell you and uh, they're going to tell their friends they're going to tell uh, google reviews they're going to tell everyone that they can right so if we can actually be ahead of that and give them a really good experience the likelihood for success also increases quite a lot so a couple of things that we can look at when we're trying to build this into our model close rates time to close satisfaction rates and things like that right so again making it really easy but really transparent as business owners to see everything that's happening in the complete journey of the business right Again, the transform stage. So this one's a little bit different than, than probably what you're expecting. But again, making sure that that whole process is a little bit easier. So making things easier in terms of, you know, playbooks and training, do it over video, you know, do webinar, whatever it may be, having real time data that's there for them and then consistency of performance. So what we find is if the culture is there, and we've got all of the processes into place, the performance level stays consistent and we can then have very predictable um, return on investment, right? Which is really, really important. This one is, is my favorite, sell them and forget them, uh, is not a process in sales anymore. What we want to do is we need to make sales accountable for customer success as well. So again, that idea of anyone in sales Everyone in sales is in customer success and in sales and everyone else in the business is in is in customer success and sales as well, because they are so important fundamentals for a business growth. Right now, again, how can we do this? Very easy, transparent, um, help everyone educate each other in terms of your product, in terms of your service and then. Make coaching part of the operation system, right? And again, it sounds simple when you say it out loud, but a lot of businesses don't, where they've got one or two people in the business that know everything about everything. Whereas what we need to have is we need to have people that are really good at a lot of things and they can share knowledge between each other, right? And that will make things a lot easier. And then from a metrics perspective, customer retention rate, rep productivity, employee happiness. Employee happiness is obviously really important in that journey, okay? Now, the last part of this is, is really um is really then about sort of where we can build that productivity levels throughout the journey, right? And one of them is, is video, right? Is in my opinion, is the most un underutilized resource for anyone in sales 
at any shape or form when they're building out their sales model, right? For me, it's a good way to ask frequently asked questions, but it's a way of building revenue, building trust, and it's a way of, you know, making people feel that can't say no to someone's face uh, a little bit. So I'm, I'm giving you some tips on this one because I do genuinely think it will help regardless of what stage that you're on. So I've taken two very good examples here that you'll see um, uh, someone waving at us there uh, at the bottom. But that idea of recording yourself and actually having a conversation with someone, keeping it short and snappy, it, it, it automatically grabs attention. It builds that level of rapport and it's like you are actually watching a business, a video about a human uh, and not just so, excuse me, someone knocking at your door or cold calling you. If we can build this into the, the way that we do it, it becomes so easy. So the approach is really easy. It's really straightforward, but it's a great use case for cold introductions. Because if you don't know someone, you're trying to build that really close relationship, but without actually having to do a huge amount of work in terms of the amount of prep that needs to go into it. But it's literally a case of you're trying to be a human speaking to another human, right? And it's so underutilized and it's such a good thing. When, when my sales reps were using it in my team in Australia, we actually implemented this for all stages of our sales process. And when we did that, our engagement rate went from uh, our cold call rate was about when I joined was five to seven percent. Uh, we got rid of cold calls completely and we focused on one to one video. Um, and for every four videos we sent, we booked three meetings. So it's a, a slightly over and the number was actually 77. But I'm going to round it down and say it was 75 percent. So that is unheard of. So what it meant was the sales team didn't have to spend more time cold calling and picking up the phone and doing 100 dials to speak to five people. What they did was they literally did 10 videos and they literally had seven people booking time in their calendar. And to any of you that are on the call today, um, that you, if you are business owners or if you are in sales yourselves, you will appreciate how good of an engagement rate that is and the reason why it was so good was we're humans being humans and it does make such a difference that journey right the second part is the mid-sales process so again we implemented this in, in the startup in australia i i was the the, the head of sales for it. we talked through proposals and we did when we did demos so we also use it for frequently asked questions. So if someone asked a question, we'd record, we'd record it, and then we would share that with our prospects when they asked the same question again, or when we were talking through a proposal. So like what you'll see here on this slide deck, you know, if I've got a particular proposal, I'm going to be able to talk through why there's a difference in pricing. Again, you're a human being a human. It doesn't take a huge amount of time. It builds up that knowledgeable, trustful education. You're helping them. Um, and again, it saves you time. And, and that's what we were trying to get to. More time selling means likelihood for success completely and dramatically increases, right? The last one, which is my personal favorite, uh, is the post sale. So do you have a handover? Um, is there a customer success team? Is there an onboarding team? Is there someone in the, the, the dev team that wants to help? You know, there's a million different ways that it is. But again, it's that trustworthiness of that handover and using a very quick video is a very good way to do it, right? Um, so the last thing I was going to say, and we'll, we'll, I'll open it to questions as well. So just to let you all know, and again, I, I promised I wouldn't talk about HubSpot, so I'll keep this short and sweet. Uh, you guys then, everyone that's on the call, is qualified for 90% for off of HubSpot software. Um, what I would highly suggest, though, is maybe not to, to, you know, not to go straight into buying a product because I don't think that makes sense. But if you are looking to start building your sales process, we do have a free CRM system. 
Um, and the free CRM system, and I've sent the practice exercise here. The CRM system is free. It's always going to be free. But this is actually a set of lessons that you can do to step by step look at building your sales process. So that, again, everything that we've covered on the session today, that you guys will be able to implement that automatically on with your business and be able to really grow it and really understand the whole customer journey from start to finish now the last thing i was going to say and I'll, again i'll open it up for questions as well is that if you want to learn more or you do want to apply there is a startup what we call office hours so that happens every tuesday morning um so that's 10 a.m irish time so that will be i think 11 or 12 o'clock for you guys I think it's 11 o'clock if I'm correctly uh, for you guys in Moldova. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong here. But um, what you can do is you can register to that and you can come on and you can ask questions, whether it's me or whether it's one of my colleagues, you'll be able to ask them questions. And again, it could be anything around go to market strategy. And that's what we try and do is build a really inclusive program that you guys can just come and ask those questions. You guys will be part of the program regardless. Uh, the other thing is there's a knowledge sharing deck again. This is all like more around if you're looking for like marketing templates, sales templates, or you're looking for something along those lines. And then there is that unique code for signing up for the free CRM. And again, that's linked to Startup Moldova. So all you need to do is just click on that and that will give you, give you the action points as well. Um, cool. So questions. I see Maria, thank you so much for the question. I'll just read it out for everyone. Uh, so, hey, Owen, is it OK for a seller to have as well as some kind of personal communications with his customer in working process? For example, if a customer sells the cut, if the seller speaks with the customer on some other objects beside the business related topics in the situation where the customer wants to talk to the seller on some other topics, will this help the seller sound more trustworthy for their customer and strengthen their relationship a hundred percent. So yes, uh, absolutely. Um, we also just want to be, cog we just want to be aware of our own time as well. Um, so absolutely. Yes. Is the answer. Like you want to be able to help them um, as much as they can, even if it's not in relation to your own product. And I'll, I'll give you a real world example, right? So, um, I, I own a company outside of working. I own two companies outside of working in HubSpot. And one of them that we do is we take recycled materials, we turn them into fashion products, and then we sell them to the customer. So we do particularly watches, sunglasses, all that sort of stuff. Um, I had a customer that came and asked me for, they were looking for a, um, they were looking for a sculpture. Weird, weird thing that they reached out to me about, but they were looking for a sculpture made out of bog oak. Uh, which is uh, very loved in Ireland and they were looking for some tips on where to get it. So I rang the customer and by chance, I actually knew someone that did, gave them their phone number and the customer, to be honest, which it came back to me six months later and bought a watch and pair of sunglasses from me, right? Which is great. But I, my point is that I didn't spend a huge amount of time with them on that particular area that they were looking to, you know, that, that, that product that they were looking for. But what I did do is I gave them a really good experience. And even though I didn't get the rewards from, from my kindness at that period of time, I did in three, four, six months later, I can't remember the exact amount of time. So absolutely from a personal com communication standpoint, absolutely do try and help as much as you can, but be very aware of your own time, right? Um, I describe some people as time vampires, and that sounds a bit harsh, but people that just want to suck as much of your time away from you as possible. So you do have to have that kind of, you do have to be a little bit aware of, is that someone that is just there because they want to talk to me uh, about whatever it is, or is it someone that's actually genuine, that really interested in our product and service, um, but are just looking for a little bit of advice and help? Um, and that's what it's a fine balance to, to find. But um, I think good reps and good sellers can, can understand um, you know, where to toe the line between the two of those uh, are. Um, cool. Anyone else have any questions? That was a really good tech question. Thanks, Maria.
cool if anyone doesn't feel um feel comfortable with a partner in the chat you can always uh let me know uh later on i go to guys uh will pass on my details if you do have any other questions you can let me know um you can let me know through uh through email if that's if that's more comfortable for you um cool i think we just got one more there now yeah i oh, appreciate it yeah maria absolutely um yeah you just have to be kind of you have to be you have to be a little bit uh you have to be a little bit hard on your time uh, and that is one of the reasons why I mentioned GPCT and also in terms of building that process, because really your time is just as valuable as as the buyer's time. So if your time is being wasted by someone, you need to cut them and just move on. Um, and that's really, really important. So, look, guys, I'm going to give you a bit of your life back. Um, and thank you so much for, for taking the time. I really enjoyed our, our 45 minutes today. Um, and as I said, look, what I'll what I'll do is I'll pass um, the guys uh, have my details. If anyone feels more comfortable about reaching out to me directly with any questions, by all means, feel free to. Uh, if you've had any other questions around HubSpot, for instance, please reach out to me. I will happily direct you to the right person. Um, but as I said, look, thank you so much for today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully you've got something from it. And as I said, if you want a bit of homework from today's session, um, spend a bit of time on that buyer, buyer journey. And then, as I said, there is that there is that worksheet on building your buyer, your your sales process. Uh, and it's a it's about a 45 minute lesson um, and it is really, really, really helpful. Um, so, again, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll we'll chat again in the future.